So now the church must impact the community. I want us to go deeper into this part. We touched on it last week, but I want us to look at something else. Now, those of you who was on the holiness restated and applied study, you might remember the concept we talked about in the uh, study called holiness uh, restated and applied what the law reveals about the righteousness of god in social life can't go through everything today but if you have time check it out on the youtube channel so righteousness and justice administered by god's body what is biblical justice and judgment so the biblical conception of justice is primarily captured in two hebrew words mishpat and Zadaka. As Tim Keller explains, the Hebrew word for justice, Mishpat, occurs in its various forms more than 200 times in the old, in the Hebrew Old Testament. Its most basic meaning is to treat people fairly or equitably. It means acquitting or punishing every person on the merits of the case, regardless of ethnicity or social status. Anyone who does the same wrong should be given the same penalty. So if you look at Mishpat here, it's dealing with judgment, justice, ordinance, the act of deciding a case, place, court, or seat of judgment, process, procedure, litigation before judges, sentence, decision, execution of judgment, just, right, rectitude, ordinance, decision in law. I think you get the point. So, but mishpat means more than just the punishment of wrongdoing. It also means giving people their rights. So like in Deuteronomy 18, it directs that the priest of the tabernacle should be supported by a certain percentage of the people's income. So the priest of the tabernacle who devoted their life to the upkeep of the tabernacle, they were to be supported by a certain percentage of the people's income. This support is described as the priest mishpat, which means they're due or they're right. Mishpat then is giving people what they are due, whether punishment or protection or care. When most modern people see the word righteousness in the Bible, they tend to think of it in terms of private morality, such as sexual chastity or diligence in prayer and Bible study. But in the Bible, Zadaka refers to day-to-day -day living in which a person conducts all relationships in family and society with fairness, generosity, and equity. It is not surprising then to discover that Zadaka and Mishpat are brought together scores of times in the Bible. These two words roughly correspond to what some have called primary and rectifying justice. Mishpat is rectifying justice. It means punishment, uh, punishing wrongdoers and caring for the victims of unjust treatment. Primary justice or zadaka is behavior that, if it was prevalent in the world, would render rectifying justice unnecessary because everybody would be living in right relationship to everyone else. Therefore, though zadaka is primarily about being in right relationship with God, the righteous life that results is profoundly social. So Zadaka in its first element is dealing with how we are rightly related to God. And as I always say, if we are not rightly related with God, we cannot be rightly related to each other because we first go up to God to learn how to love, to love him with all our heart and our soul and our mind. We learn from God we learn from loving God how to then love our neighbor as ourself, right? So if now everyone was in right relationship with God, there would be no need for law. There would be no need for institutional law. If I was perfect in righteousness and you was perfect in righteousness, there's no need for government. There's no need for police or courts. It is the, the sin of Adam that has caused us now to need mishpat. We need rectifying justice because we don't treat each other right all the time. So we need institutional law. We need a government to uphold law. We need 
the courts and we need police, right? So the Hebrew words Zadaka and Misfit are tied together as they are more than three dozen times. The English expression that best conveys the meaning is social justice. Social justice then would not only be a biblical concept, but also a subcategory of biblical justice. So people that claim that we only need biblical justice and not social justice, this is what is called a category error or a semantic or ontological error uh, in which this in which things belong to a particular category are presented as if they belong to a different category. So we have a lot of people now who are like, oh, we don't need social justice. We just need biblical justice as if they are somehow not the same or if somehow uh, social justice does not fall under biblical justice. Now, obviously, in this world, a lot of people are miscategorizing what social justice is because they have no idea what justice and righteousness is because they have no relationship with God and they don't read his word. Biblical justice includes all forms of God-ordained justice, including the rectifying justice that belongs to the government, what we'd call public or legal justice, as well as justice between individuals, what could be called inter- individual justice and justice involving organizations and groups what we'd call social justice so well, where am i going with all of this i want you to look at this video um about the u.s supreme court uh okay just making sure i'm sharing correct here we go the Supreme Court, founded in 1789, is the judicial branch of the US government. That means it's the highest court in the US, and its main role is to be a sort of guardian of the Constitution. It hears appeal cases that relate to the Constitution, and has powers to prevent or strike down laws that are unconstitutional. To give you a sense of just how important it is, it often can decide on matters of policy that affect daily life for millions of Americans. For example, in 1973, a woman was banned from having an abortion in Texas, but the Supreme Court ruled that the constitutional right to privacy extended to this issue. And that's why women in the US are allowed to have abortions today. More recently, in 2015, the Supreme Court made same-sex marriage legal. No longer may this liberty be denied, Justice Anthony M. Kennedy wrote about the decision. The decisions are generally made by nine justices, who are appointed by the president whenever there is a vacancy. This has led to the accusation that they are essentially politicians in fine robes, since they tend to vote broadly in accordance with party lines. This means it'll often come down to a tight 5-4 split. One of the most controversial Supreme Court decisions was during the 2000s. Right. So I just wanted to give you an idea of how the US Supreme Court operates. So as the final arbiter or authority or experts of the law, the court is charged with ensuring the American people the promise of equal justice under law and thereby also functions as a guardian and interpreter of the constitution. So those Supreme Court justices are supposed to interpret the original intent of the constitution in regards to court cases that reach them, right? So they have to interpret the US constitution and be the guardians of it. That means make sure that it's upheld and be the interpreters of it for contemporary situations. So situations that have come up regarding abortion and gay marriage, et cetera, et cetera. So in the way that, in the same way that the US Supreme Court judges are meant to be experts and interpreters of the US constitution to ensure justice under the law, so we kingdom citizens have been called by God to be administrators of the king's righteousness, to be, to be an individual and collective body of demonstrators of the king's judgment, perspective and justice, righteousness. So I spoke last week with a scripture says that, do you not know that the saints will judge the world and that we will judge angels so the point of us having the mind of christ from now is not only for now it's to prepare us for what we are going to be doing in the end times and in the summation of all things so we need to have the the mind of christ we need to have his perspective 
and we need to be just like him. We need to right be righteous like him because we here as kingdom citizens, as his government, his agency, his his government to to transform the world, the people who have been sent to be light and salt. We have to be the guardians and interpreters of the constitution that he has given us, which is the Bible. So we are to show the world. Here is the word of God, and this is how it pertains to this situation. This is how it pertains to this situation. And not just show them in terms of here's what it says, to live it. So we, like the Supreme Court judges, we are the priests, yeah? And we are the royal uh, family of God. We demonstrate and show the world and interpret to the world his constitution his word proverbs 21 3 says to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the lord than sacrifice what does this mean the moral duties of the kingdom what is holy just and good which the law requires god expects right relationship with him and justice to men that which is just and right between man and man, which especially if done from the right principles and with right views is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Not more than any sacrifice, such as the sacrifice of a broken heart or the sacrifice of praise or thanksgiving or of acts of goodness and benevolence or of a man's bodily, bodily living sacrifice, but more acceptable than ceremonial sacrifices. So when this was stated in Proverbs, now this is in the Old Testament where they are doing, you know, temple sacrifices, they are doing sacrifices for sin and so on. But the scripture is saying that the right attitude and the right mind and the right heart towards God is more important than these ceremonial duties. So though these ceremonial uh duties were divinely instituted and were typical of Christ and when offered up in faith with the right attitude were acceptable to God however when these are done in faith and in hypocrisy well, sorry when these are done without faith and in hypocrisy and especially when done to cover immoral actions they become a stench in the nostrils of God he prefers the heart that desires righteousness than the head that is conscious of it for the purposes of religious duty Matthew 5 verse 6 says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The God of the Old Testament is not different to the God of the New Testament. God always required the heart of the person who was offering the sacrifice. When I say he required their heart, he required them to be doing the sacrifices for the right reasons. So it wasn't just that in the Old Testament, as long as you fulfill these religious ceremonial duties, God accepted them. No, God has always wanted the right heart. He's always wanted us to do what is required of us, not out of duty, but out of an obligation to him because we love him and because we realize it, it benefits us to live righteously. It benefits, benefits us to live holy. We shouldn't just be, you know, gathering together coming to prayer meeting coming to church and doing it because this is what the bible requires no i recognize that as a kingdom citizen it's necessary for me to fellowship with the saints of god it's necessary for me to offer the sacrifices of praise because i love god and when you love someone you you keep their commandments when you love someone to have a conversation with them to have a relationship with them is not duty so god is not asking for us to to to, to be believers and to be a part of the kingdom as some sort of tick box exercise this is something we're supposed to be wholly um devoted to because we love to do it god wants us to love him and to keep his commandments because we love him so our inherited mission as the church isaiah 42 6 says i the lord have called you the messiah for a righteous purpose in righteousness i will take you by the hand and will keep you i will give you for a covenant to the people israel for a light to the nations the gentiles to open the eyes of the blind to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who sit in darkness 
from the prison. So Jesus, who is the king of the kingdom, who came and showed us the way and showed us what he requires of us, he requires now us as the church to be a light to the nations, to be a light to those unbelievers. Isaiah 9 verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. With this information in mind, where do we start in our quest to discover the appropriate response of the church with regards to social justice? Psalms 89, 14 says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. We can't see, we can see, sorry, judgment as a correct application of God's moral character in all spheres of life. He has shown us in his word that being perfectly just and doing only that which is right underpins his authority. His authority and sovereign rule are established in righteousness, a standard of perfection far above anything or anyone in existence outside of himself can claim to possess. By studying the practical application of the law in the kingdom of Israel, its intent, its fulfillment by Christ, the head of the church and the kingdom, we gain an understanding of how the divine nature, his holiness, is applied by, is, is sorry, his sorry, of how the divine nature, his holiness, is applied by the body of Christ. Our motive for helping people should not be based on things like ethnicity or social status. Justice should be administered based on the constitution, which is the word, primarily on the righteousness of the author, the judge and the lawmaker, the Lord Jesus Christ. To pass judgment or to administer justice on any other basis outside of Mishpat, and Zadaka is unlawful and will, un will lead to poor judgment. His constitution is the authority on all things. So when the church is now administering social justice, we don't go to the world to find out what causes that we should support or how we should uh, support causes. We, as the church, are under the king who is the author of justice and righteousness. So when the church is seeking, and the church meaning us individually and collectively, when we are seeking uh, to demonstrate the justice and righteousness of God, it cannot be based on anything but what is right according to his word. So therefore, we cannot support Black Lives Matter, not because Black Lives don't matter, but because Black Lives Matter has support some causes that don't line up with the scripture. Because Black Lives Matter was started by two lesbians who hate the family, who in the constitution said they want to destroy the traditional family of a man and a woman. So the church should never be looking outwards for who or what cause we should support in. We should be bringing up the things that we know that are not right and that are not pure and that are not just. And we should be saying the church stands for this because this is wrong according to the constitution. The Bible, God's word is of the authority on all things. The church should not be following anyone's lead in terms of justice and judgment. It is an affront and it is a disgrace to the God of the Bible to join with any other group that 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 is that is coming up with social justice causes that if that group is not completely aligned to the Bible, it is a disgrace and it is a dishonor to God. The church should be at the for forefront of what is just and what is right according to the word, right? the righteousness of God. Revelation 18, it says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. 
our righteousness comes from God and the church must demonstrate justice and judgment based on God's perfect righteousness. We have to get our righteousness from God. Our right standing doesn't come from the world. And so when we talk about administrating justice, this justice must be based on the judge. The church, the body of Christ, his hand extended, should seek to administer mishpat, retributive justice. Its individual members should be, should in their personal lives be operating out of the principle of Zedaka, distributive justice. So when we are in right relationship with God, right, we love God as we should do, and we love our neighbor as ourselves, the church being an institution, being the body, can now administer retributive justice because we are in relation relationship with God and we are getting um our, all of our ideas on justice and righteousness and love from him then the body of Christ can now administer misfat accordingly so a church now has a responsibility to serve the community within which it is placed it must answer the issues of its community as well as its members so we know the bible says that you know we should we should do good to the household of faith first right so primarily yes we are here to make sure that justice and judgment is done in um interpersonally in in the body of christ but when it comes to outside the body of christ we still have a duty to people outside the body of christ so i've put here if the church is predominantly black and the most vulnerable people in the community where the church is based is asian it should seek to administer misfat to serve them. The principle applies to all possibilities in this scenario. So regardless of the makeup of the church, that church has to serve its community. That church should answer the issues of its community. Why? Because that is administrating justice based on the judge. God is not just concerned with the people who are in that building. If, as I said last week, if God places a church in a community, he didn't just give you the bricks of that building. He gave you the land. So we should be seeking the good of everybody around us. We should be seeking to open the kingdom up to them, whether they are Muslim or Hindu, black or white, Chinese, um, Ethiopian. Doesn't matter what the church is made up of. That church is assigned to that community to impact it. To show them the love and the righteousness of our king. So what does the scripture say about this? We can find these principles in the Old Testament. Leviticus 19, 33, 34. If a stranger dwells with you in your land, you shall not mistreat him. The stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 10, 17 to 19, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and the and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. So we're in a community now, for example, we're all in a church. And in that community, there's a lot of drug addicts. There's a lot of um, single parents, and there's a lot of children struggling to eat, but they all happen to be, uh, say, Muslim and Hindu. Does that mean we completely ignore those children and those and those people? Why? Because we're why why would we avoid them? If we are doing what we should do amongst our own people, and people are are in in our church are predominantly okay, and we're we're administering misfat to those amongst our community in the church, why would we not then extend our hand outside? That does it make sense that we wouldn't do that? Well, the Bible says we should. Because our God administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. So if we as a as a body, as a church, can afford to clothe and feed and, and to provide support 
for people in our community who do not look like us and do not believe like us, we are called to do it. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered, you shall love the Lord your God, all your heart, with all your soul and all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Who is your neighbor? Before we move on, I want to take any comments or questions. Do you believe, have I proven that the church has a responsibility to impact its community? Or does anybody disagree? If you agree, you can say. If you don't agree, you can say. I agree. Go ahead. Thank you. I agree also. The Lord reigns on the just and the unjust. But what also came to my mind was when the Lord told us, told the um, apostles to go and tell all nations. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so I just, that was on my mind as you were speaking. So I just want to share that. Yeah, and practical evangelism to the nations sometimes is to feed them if they're poor. Because that's what, isn't that what Jesus did when he came and he preached and he said, you know, these people are hungry. We've got to feed them before I preach to them. That's right. Yes. He fed them first. He saw their need. And then he uh, shared the word. Word, yeah. Yeah. We sometimes, over, we, we not over-spiritualize, we sometimes, we have a good handle on the spiritual aspect of what God expects of us, but we don't have an understanding of the, of the practical aspect. I think I said it last week. There's a saying that goes, no one knows um, that you care. Sorry, no one cares what you know until they know that you care. So like <laughs> God has called us to impact people in many different ways. And James uh, 2, this is, I was trying to quote this last week, but my memory sometimes is very bad. So James, sorry, I'm just pulling it up. Uh, James 2 verse 16 says, if, and one of you, sorry, Sorry, James 2.15 should be. James 2 verse 15 says, if a, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? What doth it profit? So there is a practical element to our evangelism and to our, to our impact. Yeah, we're dealing with human beings. We're dealing with men. And the thing is, God always deals with humans according to their humanity. And sometimes we just want to deal with people spiritually, but un not understanding there's a, there's a holistic uh, approach that needs to be taken because Jesus dealt with every part of man but sometimes we just want to deal with the spiritual part that's not how it works okay so the life-giving power of the church through Christ Genesis 3 15 says and I will put enmity open hostility between you and the woman and between your seed your offspring and her seed he shall fatally bruise your head and you shall only bruise his heel so the church in this scripture uh, the church in scripture is referred to as a woman. So we know Genesis 3 verse 15 is, is, is uh, talking about Jesus, but the church is also in scripture referred to as a woman, right? The church is a body that opens the kingdom of God to people. Spiritually, it is a place of rebirth and birth. The church of Jesus Christ gives birth to sons of God. Jesus answered and said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. The church is in the business of reproduction, bringing people 
into Christ's image according to Ephesians 4 verse 13. The church must produce and reproduce. The church must give birth to sons of God, right? It has the power, the life-giving power of Christ to give power, to give birth to sons of God, right? So the church has power. So how do we go about?